Lovelies, and welcome back to Strange Playgrounds. Welcome back to this first in a series of reviews which are going to be the antithesis of my Chronicles of Narnia retrospectives. Welcome to the His Dark Materials retrospectives. Now, His Dark Materials is something I didn't discover until well late on. It's one of those series where it was published when I was sort of in my uh, uh, mid to late teens, I believe, originally. And I it kind of passed me by. I didn't notice it existed until much later on. It was, until the advent of Harry Potter, it was the most popular, biggest selling children's franchise in written fiction in the UK. It was really significant, very, very popular, and quite frankly, vastly, vastly, vastly superior to Harry Potter on almost every level. Treats its readers far more respectively, uh, has far more to say to its readers on an ideological level, and is just a, a much better written series of books uh, on a technical level, on a purely sentence structure, paragraph, rhythm level. It is a better written story. Um... His Dark Materials is a fascinating one. I came across it uh, while I was at university, actually. I came across it at university because the BBC did this really huge series of programs where they surveyed pretty much the entire nation based on their favourite books. So it was like the nation's 100, fa 100 greatest favourite books, basically. And His Dark Materials, all of the top ten I recognised, all of them except... His Dark Materials. And His Dark Materials came in at number three, I believe, like really high up. And I was like, how how on earth can I not know about this? And they had a, I can't even remember who it was, but they had a particular celebrity who liked His Dark Materials talking about why it was their favourite book. And listening to them talk about it, I, I, they, they were talking about all this this fantastical metaphysics, this stuff about alternate realities and and dimensions and angels and gods and demons and dust. And I was like, how do I not know about this? How can I possibly not know about this? So on the basis of that, the next day went straight out to Waterstones, bought all of them, bought all three of the books, as there were only three back then. Um, and I devoured them absolutely devoured them. First of all, on a purely technical level, these books are so readable. They're so readable. Philip Pullman has a very particular style of, of writing that's very like a movie script. It's very pared down. It's very simple. Very easy to get to grips with. You can read 40 pages of uh, Philip Pullman and it feels like you've read 10, you know? He's that kind of writer. What I also found fascinating is why it was written because his dark materials was in direct conflict with another one of the series that was in the top five which is of course c.s lewis's chronicles of narnia philip pullman wrote his dark materials as a tonic to the chronicles of narnia philip pullman is an atheist he is an anti-authoritarian and he is uh, of the left very very much so and he regards the chronicles of narnia as a perversion of imagination and he said as such in interviews he believes that it is a cruel uh, metaphysically moribund uh, adult trying to impose their own abusive strictures upon children and so he wrote his dark materials to establish a narrative a mythology and a metaphysics which where just as the chronicles of narnia enshrines subordination and submission and obedience his dark materials emphasizes rebellion and curiosity and pleasure and delight it's a really beautiful piece of work it set the first book the northern lights bizarrely rechristened the golden compass in the u.s don't know why the alethiometer isn't called the golden compass and i don't believe is ever even referred to as the golden compass but hey ho it's the alethiometer there we go um it's set in an alternate dimension an alternate reality which is so close to ours that it's actually very recognizable 
So it's set in an alternate reality UK, uh, in Oxford of all places, in Oxford University primarily, not exclusively, but primarily. And the rules in this reality are different. So certain things happened in this reality that didn't happen in ours. So in this reality, the equivalent of the Catholic Church, which is called the Magisterium, is in control of everything. There was probably no Renaissance or enlightenment in this era, in this world. There was certainly no enlightenment because even where science occurs, the church controls, determines, and restricts it based on its agendas. The magisterium, as it's called, is a gigantic theocracy that controls everything in the world and which is violent, is aggressive, it suppresses everything. Uh, another interesting difference between our reality and that reality is that human beings ha are born with these metaphysical familiars called demons and fam and demons are little animal creatures that accompany uh, human beings throughout their lives when they're children they can shift shape between different animals to determine or rather to reflect the moods and emotional states of their companions uh, as children come of age their demons crystallize into a particular shape or form which kind of reflects what their personalities are going to be so in this reality there's a whole range of etiquettes and communications that don't exist in ours and Pullman does a really good job of drawing what those etiquettes and communications are it's a very difficult thing to realize because of course you've got to create an entire mode of communication entire forms of protocol and you've got to think about how would that have influenced the development of this world and it's something Pullman does really beautifully well the primary focus of the story is a girl called Lyra who's an orphan who is uh, bizarrely she's sort of a ward of Oxford it's Itself. She kind of runs rampant around the college and it's got a kind of steer pike quality to her in a way. Very much like steer pike, she wanders. There is a Gormenghast influence in this book that is huge, by the way. It takes o the, the University of Oxford and turns it into this very Gormenghast like place of, of secret tombs and tunnels and high rooftops. And Lyra is this acrobatic, rebellious child who is eminently curious, who sort of runs and hurts and jumps along the roofs of Oxfordshire. It's great fun. It's on a purely aesthetic level or a superficial level. It is great fun. I can see why children would eat this up. It's the kind of story that I would have adored. Were I, if I'd read it as like a an eight-year-old, I would have gone nuts for it. It would have been one of those books that obsessed me and defined my life in very much the same way that The Lord of the Rings and similar books did at that age when I was a kid. It's beautifully written. It's lots of fun. Lyra is a great character. She's the opposite of Lucy from the Chronicles of Narnia. She is the total opposite of her. Whereas Lucy and the Pevensey children in general from the Chronicles of Narnia are these hollow shells of children. They, are, they only exist to reflect what the adult writer wants of children or demands of children. Yeah, They're vessels for C.S. Lewis's agendas. Lyra isn't. She is this rebellious, quite naughty, little girl who is she operates according to her own curiosities basically she's this wild factor who is violent and aggressive and pretty much does what she wants uh, regardless of what cautions whisper in her ear often via the medium of her demon pan he's often whispering in her ear as her subconscious he's saying to her oh you better be careful larry he often ignores her he often uh, him rather he often ignores pan she often ignores pan which is really interesting it's it sets up just by that conception alone you have this automatic means by which readers can recognize or get an intimation of what certain characters are like but also you have this psychological interplay it's a beautiful and brilliant notion. You also have introduced very early this notion that there are multiple different realities. So that's introduced very, very early on. And also this concept of dust. Now, dust is with a big capital D. And it's it's referenced, but very it's not really explained what it is. It is this possibly metaphysical substance that is essential to all things it basically holds the universe together it's like dark matter it's very much a metaphor for dark matter but also 
for other things as well. The dust is this very mysterious phenomena and substance that we know is attracted to children for some reason. Dust is also a conscious thing. It seems to be what it's what metaphysics is made of. What I love about the concept of dust in the book is that it remains mysterious. Even when you have some explanation for what it is later on, it remains mysterious. It is quite, quite brilliant in that regard. The story follows Lyra as she finds things out about herself, like, for example, things about her past, who her parents are, for example. Uh, there are some stunning protagonists and antagonists in this book. One of the things that Pullman does beautifully well is he takes a leaf out of Roald Dahl's book and the adults in these stories are almost always wrong. Almost always, on some level. They're either morally wrong or they're confused or they're uncertain. They just get things wrong a lot of the time. And the one, the antagonists, which are technically Lord Azrael, who is my favourite character, by the way, and Marissa Coulter, who is one of the driving forces of this book. They are not just wrong or confused. They're also twisted. There's something... Marissa Coulter, in particular, is this wonderfully drawn character. She is essentially an abusive parent. They both are, to certain degrees. But Marissa has more time with Lyra. And so you get to see the interplay and the dynamic of the abusive parent much more. Um, she demands of Lyra that she be what she wants her to be. And of course, Lyra resists. And in the end, the tension between them is profound. There's like a hate relationship between them. It's quite beautifully drawn. It is quite brilliant. All the way through, you are getting these tensions between uh, people who are trying, people and powers who are trying to cage and define imagination, experience, thought, and those like Lyra who represent its freedom, its desire to be out of boundaries, its desire to be out of adult prescriptions. And it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. I mean, there are, you can draw certain criticisms of that metaphysics and that dynamic because there is a sort of chosen one narrative here where Lyra is Lyra has a particular destiny to follow, but it relies upon her being rebellious. It's, there is a certain contradiction there, isn't there? Surely, I mean, surely destiny and fate by its very nature is a restrictive and oppressive and prescriptive thing, yeah? But it's a prescription of liberation, bizarrely. Lyra has a much wider function to perform, if you like, but she has to do it without any kind of conscious influence from anyone around her because it has to be a rebellion it has to be her own choice you know it's really strange in that regard and then of course you can argue well if the destiny is there anyway if the metaphysics is in place how can it be a choice you know there, there are problems there certainly with the metaphysics that Pullman draws but by and large not only is it metaphysically and ideology ideologically a brilliant book for children to read but also for adults as well by the way it's inspiring, it's beautiful, it's very well written. The world it, it draws is gorgeous. There's so much intriguing stuff in this world. Things that are very children's fantasy, the talking polar bears, for example, that turn up at one point, Yorick Bernison and his, his tribe of talking polar bears. It's brilliant. It's absolutely wonderful. And there are also things that are very, very grittily real. Very grittily real indeed. It's fascinating. It's a, as an opening uh, instalment to a trilogy. It's out there. It really is. It's probably one of the best I've read for the for a very long time. And by the way, if you if you are looking for an alternative to um, Harry Potter for your children to read, which by the way I think you probably should, given lots of factors, um, I can't think of anything better. If I'm perfectly honest, I can't think of anything better to start them with. When we come back, my loves, we'll take a look at the second book, which is the. Um, uh, the Subtle Knife, my favourite in the entire series. So, until then, my loves, bye-bye!